How Sex in the City Changed Fashion in the 2000s. If you were fashion or TV obsessed in the early aughts, then you're probably well aware of what a phenomenon Sex and the City was. Inspired by the book of the same name by Candace Bushnell, the Sex and the City show ran from 1998 to 2004, spawned two films, and had a short-lived prequel series. Besides being one of the most popular shows of the early 2000s, it also served as the inspiration for dozens of fashion trends. The outfits in the show, designed by Patricia Field and Rebecca Weinberg, were less about functionality and wearability and more about emulating editorial fashion of the time and followed a more is more mentality. Many of the outfits featured designer products mixed with affordable pieces. Some of the fashion trends inspired by the show came and went quickly, but others continue to be popular to this day. So let's take a look at some of the fashion trends that were influenced by the characters in Sex and the City. Manolo Blahnik. And your Manolo Blahniks. What? No. Give me your Blahniks. These guys weren't just after money anymore. They were after fashion. Please, sir, they're my favorite pair. Oh my God! Shh, Gary. Do you, do you know what these are? We're not even supposed to be in here. Manolo, Blonick, Mary Jane's. I thought these were an urban shoe myth. And if they don't fit, so help me, I'm gonna wear them anyway. Sex in the City single-handedly made Manola Blahnik a household name. The Spanish shoe brand first rose in popularity in the 70s, when they focused on creating sleek stilettos and pumps instead of the then-popular platform silhouette. The brand loaned out dozens of shoes to the production, and Carrie Bradshaw wears numerous pairs of Manolos throughout the series, with the shoe making up a large part of the character's $40,000 shoe collection. At 400 bucks a pop, how many of these do you have? 50? Come on. A hundred? Would that be wrong? One hundred times four hundred. There's your damn payment. Well, that's only four thousand. No, it's forty thousand. <gasps> I spent forty thousand dollars on shoes and I have no place to live? How much were they? Uh, four hundred and eighty-five. Oh, come on, Carrie. That's insane. Well, that's what they cost. I'm sorry, I just think that's crazy to spend that much on shoes. You know how much Manolas are you used to wear Manolas. Considering how regularly Carrie complains about having no money, it's kind of ridiculous how many pairs of the $400 shoes she has. I have no fortune. I didn't need a cookie to tell me that. Manolo Blahnik shoes also play a rather large role in the first Sex and the City movie, with Big using a pair of royal blue satin Hangisi pumps to propose to Carrie with. This gave said bejeweled shoes some major star power, and the Hangisi was featured on the feet of numerous celebrities following the release of the film. And here's a fun fact you might enjoy. Blahnik also designed shoes for the 2006 Marie Antoinette film, specifically the ones in the legendary I Want Candy montage. Animal print. Animal furs have been used as clothing since the dawn of mankind, but it wasn't until the 1930s that the attention-grabbing print itself became a popular and accessible pattern for everyone, and was featured on just about everything from swimsuits to scarves to rugs. The print was initially popularized with cheetah and leopard patterns, but went on to include snake, zebra, and even giraffe. Animal print went in and out of fashion repeatedly, with the trend going from chic and subtle in the 1950s, to bright and bold through the 1970s and 1980s, to nude and neutral in the 2010s. In the early 2000s, the print was most commonly associated with products for children and teens, like Lisa Frank or the Cheetah Girls, for instance. Jenny! So ladies, is everything fabulous? It is now. I, I didn't know you were here. And I didn't know you knew Carrie Bradshaw. You are fabulous. Oh, talk to the hand, Grandma. <laughs> but Sex and the City made it regain popularity with older demographics. The print, and animal furs in general, were often worn by Carrie Bradshaw and Samantha Jones. The two characters were the most open about their sexuality of the main foursome, making the print choice a possible ode to one of the most sexual film characters put to screen, Mrs. Robinson, who herself inspired an animal print craze in the 60s. Headbands. When you think of 2000s preppy brunettes who wear headbands, your first thought might go to Blair Waldorf from Gossip Girl, but Upper East Sider Charlotte York actually did it first. 
Of the four women, Charlotte's style is probably the safest, with a character wearing clothing items that match her more traditionally feminine and conservative values. You should feel bad. Do you ever think about how she'd feel if she found out? Yes, I think about it all the time. No, you don't. You think about what would happen to you if she found out. You don't think about her. She's just the idiot wife. You don't know anything about her. But if you're serious about a guy, then you have to keep him in a holding pattern for at least five dates. Or you've gone up. Yes, because the number of dates that you wait to have sex with a man is directly proportional to your age. That's not the point. What's going on? She stole my baby name. You bitch. The character is often featured wearing cardigans, bandeau dresses, and as previously mentioned, headbands. This allowed the trend to distance itself away from school children and towards a more mature look. Teeny tiny purses. I'll go into detail about specific tiny purses from the show in a second, but let's get into the silhouette itself first. In the early 90s, prior to the release of Sex and the City, bags that focused on functionality were all the rage. This included large tote bags, leather satchels, crossbody messenger bags, and hands-free backpacks and belt bags. Smaller purses eventually came into style in the late 90s with the release of bags like the Lady Dior in 1995 and the Fendi Baguette in 1997. During the show, the characters appeared to have a penchant for petite shoulder bags and handheld clutches, a pretty stark difference from the colossal purses they're shown carrying in the films, the result of the mid-2000s giant bag craze. Recent purse trends have reverted back to the smaller silhouette, just another instance of fashion being cyclical. I myself love a tiny purse, but there definitely is such a thing as too tiny. The Fendi Baguette. You can't swing a Fendi purse without knocking over five losers. The quote-unquote it bag since its release in 1997, the Fendi Baguette has had over a thousand iterations and is widely considered one of the most iconic purses in history, which is fairly ironic as the Italian brand was struggling at the time. According to an interview with Sarah Jessica Parker, Fendi loaned out multiple baguette bags to the production early on, which prompted more designers to do the same after seeing the show's immediate influence on the market. The bag itself became so synonymous with Sex and the City, specifically Carrie Bradshaw, that in recent years Sarah Jessica Parker has not only starred in a Fendi baguette advertisement, Oh, this isn't a bag, it's a baguette but designed her own bag for the brand as well. The baguette has appeared on the character many, many, many times, and a purple sequined baguette even prompted a memorable line about the purse. Give me a bag. What? Your bag. It's a baguette. Also, not that it's important or anything, but I think it's absolutely hilarious that in the prequel series, The Carrie Diaries, Carrie is shown with a Fendi baguette, even though it takes place nearly two decades before the purse was even created. While Carrie is the character who's most commonly associated with the bag, Samantha also seems to enjoy a baguette on occasion, with the character even purchasing a fake Fendi at one point in the show. The Dior Saddlebag Released in 2000, the Dior Saddlebag was heralded as fashion's hottest purse the moment John Galliano featured it on the runway. The unique kidney-shaped shoulder bag was featured in a season 3 episode of Sex and the City on the arm of Carrie Bradshaw, giving the bag the show's unofficial seal of approval. And in following years, the bag was seen repeatedly on the arm of Y2K queen Paris Hilton. While the bag isn't seen on the show as often as the baguette, its cameo on the show solidified its place as a must-have accessory in the aughts. And just like the Fendi baguette, it's made a major comeback recently. The Birkin. Not necessarily a tiny bag, but iconic to the show nonetheless. Unless you were fabulously wealthy or were really into fashion, odds are you had no idea what an Hermes Birkin was before Samantha put it on your radar. In a season 4 episode, Samantha spends the entirety of it trying and failing to get her hands on the elusive Birkin, and its appearance raised questions like, one, who the hell were buying these things, and two, How could we get our hands on one? First introduced to the public in 1984, the crocodile skin Birkin bag was not an immediate success, finding it difficult to compete with the more popular purses of the time. In the show, the red Hermes Birkin that Samantha attempts to buy is said to cost $4,000 and has a five-year wait list, which was fairly accurate for 2001. The bags were and continue to be seen as a luxury product and status symbol. They're a way of not so subtly letting the world know that you have money to spare. They're often touted as quote-unquote investments by those who purchase them. So I've collected many handbags, namely MS handbags, which are my favorite because of the investment value that I believe in. 
which does have some truth to it considering many of the rarer designs actually increase in value. While Hermes says they no longer employ a wait list, they are similar to most high fashion brands in that they prioritize certain clients, like Victoria Beckham, Kylie Jenner, Jamie Shua, by giving them first pick of limited designs. The show references this by having Samantha attempt to bypass the waitlist by saying the bag is for Lucy Liu. Look what I got. Some nice man dropped it off at my hotel this morning. Hermes. It's a bur- Birkin. Well, it's not really my style, but hey, it's a free bag. No, it, it's, it's not exactly free. You see, I, I paid for it. That's my bag. What do you mean? Well, there was a five-year waiting list. Blah, blah, blah. I used your name. Blah, blah, blah. While I myself am not the type to purchase a now $12,000 bag, it's still fascinating to see how the Birkin became so iconic, especially when it's so unattainable for so many. Cropped haircuts. Short haircuts on women have often been stereotyped as being less feminine and less attractive, and thus were commonly avoided. Short haircuts had their first surge in popularity when a young Audrey Hepburn was featured with a pixie cut in the 1953 film Roman Holiday. And in the years that followed, short haircuts were popularized by other style icons like Twiggy, Halle Berry, Edie Sedgwick, Mia Farrow, Demi Moore, and Winona Ryder. For the majority of the show's run, Miranda Hobbs is shown with some type of short haircut, beginning with a short cropped cut in early seasons and ending with a slightly longer bob by the end of the show. The no-fuss style not only fit the workaholic character, but became popular with the general public after the style proved it was versatile enough for both casual and dressy occasions. Power suits. The term power dressing was first coined in the 70s, when women were beginning to join the previously male-dominated workforce en masse, and quote-unquote power suits became the unofficial term for women's workwear through the 80s. There was a decline in power suits during the early 90s when business casual attire was popularized. That is, up until Sex and the City began regularly featuring two of their characters in power suits. Both Samantha and Miranda wear power suits throughout the series, albeit in vastly different styles. Samantha's suits often featured bright colors, attention-grabbing accessories, and tighter silhouettes, while Miranda's were reminiscent of men suits at the time, muted in color and oversized. Both women's suits prove that even in a professional environment, you can still have fun and be fashionable. The slip dress. I could do an entire video about the underwear as outerwear trend, but that's a topic for another day. Prior to the 90s, slips were worn as intended, underneath clothes. What's up, daddy? What the hell is that? A dress. Says who? Calvin Klein. But after slip dresses and nighties were featured in runway collections by designers like Calvin Klein, Helmut Lang, and John Galliano, the lingerie-inspired trend exploded and was worn by the likes of Rosie Perez, Kate Moss, Gwyneth Paltrow, Naomi Campbell, Drew Barrymore, Madonna, Jennifer Aniston, and even Princess Diana. In the show, every single female lead wears a slip dress at least once, making it one of the few clothing trends that was able to fit with every character's style. And it solidified the trend not only only something 20-something models and celebrities could wear, but something older women could pull off as well. Exposed bras. Both Samantha and Carrie were regularly shown wearing exposed undergarments, and while many decried the trend as cheap and tacky, it definitely made an impact. Carrie had outfits that showed either the strap or front of her bra, and sometimes she didn't wear a top at all. This happens to be one of my least favorite trends on this list. Flower Power For a large portion of the third season, Carrie Bradshaw was seen wearing gigantic fabric flowers, usually pinned onto her clothes but occasionally worn in her hair as well. The trend was brief, thankfully, but I definitely remember seeing grown women in the 2000s pinning giant silk flowers onto their blazers or on the strap of their dresses. The Tutu One of the most iconic articles of clothing from the entire series is Carrie's white tutu skirt. It was featured in the opening credits of every episode of the show and was briefly shown in the first Sex and the City film. The tutu in question was purchased by Rebecca Weinberg for $5. Typically, tutus are associated with ballerinas or children, so seeing a grown woman prancing about New York in a tiered tulle skirt definitely made an impression on viewers. Her other tutu of note is in the final episode of the show, but is much more wearable than the first. Even to this day, tutu skirts with fitted tops are popular, and it's hard to not see any iteration of the outfit as an ode to Carrie Bradshaw. Gold nameplate necklaces. 
In no way did Patricia Field or Sex and the City invent nameplate necklaces. They just brought them to their majority white demographic's attention. Field admits to seeing the necklaces worn by quote-unquote kids in the neighborhood and decided to see if Sarah Jessica Parker liked it, which she did. And from season two onwards, Carrie is seen wearing her gold nameplate necklace a lot. It was such a crucial part of the character that there's an entire episode dedicated to her losing it. Nowadays, if you look up nameplate necklaces, Carrie Bradshaw or Sex in the City will probably be the first results to come up, which is a little bit odd considering Carrie doesn't even like gold all that much. It was a pear-shaped diamond oh. with a gold band. Oh, ick! Ugh, no wonder you threw up. It's just not me. You wear gold jewelry? Yeah, like ghetto gold for fun, but this is my engagement ring. What's important to note about this trend is that in no way is Carrie Bradshaw or Sex and the City the originator. For those unaware, nameplate necklaces actually hold cultural significance, where the necklaces were seen as a rite of passage for young women and a way to show pride in their heritage. I'll include a few links to articles that explain the importance and origins of these nameplate necklaces in the description. I highly recommend checking them out because the necklaces are so much more than trendy statement jewelry. And it's impossible to talk about fashion, especially early 2000s fashion, without acknowledging the impact people of color had on the aesthetic. Well, that's all for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment down below which outfit from Sex in the City was your favorite. I'll see you soon. Bye.